Hi there, my name is Valerie and today I would like to discuss with you Book of Mormon Life Lessons for the Last Days. Basically, I have summarized the first 200 of the 200 pages of the Book of Mormon on 10 slides. So let's get into that. So first let's answer the question, what is the Book of Mormon? Basically, it's a volume of holy scripture comparable to the Bible. And I know that that is a large claim, but if you read it, you'll know that what I'm saying is true. Uh, it's a sacred ref record of a refugee remnant of the House of Israel in ancient America. It was written from 600 BC to 420 AD, so just over about a, four, a thousand years, by a host of prophet king authors. The compiler and editor of all of these authors is a man named Mormon, and he was commanded by the Lord to take records and compile them into this book, this Book of Mormon. Um, after he finished um, compiling and editing um, select pieces of this 1,000 year of history, um, he handed the records to his son, and his son Moroni hid the records up, um, and Moroni was, Moroni was the last survivor of the Nephites. There's two groups of people that are primarily talked about in the Book of Mormon, the Nephites and the, and the Lamanites. Moroni was the last survivor of the Nephites. In 1823, this same Moroni, then a resurrected person, visited the Prophet Joseph Smith and delivered the engraved Book of Mormon plates to him. So that brings you up to speed on the history of the Book of Mormon and what it is. What are the missions of the Book of Mormon? It is to convert House of Israel remnants on the Western Hemisphere to Christ. It's also to convince the Jew and Gentile both, everyone basically, of Christ as the Savior, that saving power lies, lies in him and him alone. Also to teach everyone, Jew and Gentile, of God's covenants and witness of the truth of the Bible. So the um, Book of Mormon was written on the Western Hemisphere. The Bible was written, written on the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, you bring them both together and they both speak the truth of each other. Another mission of the Book of Mormon is to restore plain and precious truths. We'll actually cover one of those in the Book of Mormon today. And it's also to prepare us for the millennium. And there's a hint there that the Lord wants all of us to be more obedient to him because it's just a higher and holier way. It's the best way, his way. All right, so as I mentioned, it's gonna be 200 pages on 10 slides. You'll see it go through the history of these, the lives of these people, the prophecy, the prophecy that they have about our day. You'll see things foreshadow. So things that happened in their past are gonna to happen to us in our future. Um, you'll see that there are a lot of lectures in here. So yes, it follows their lives, but along the way they pause and provide instruction. And that instruction is meant from, uh, for us. Many of these men saw our day. So what did they see? And um, why does it behoove us to learn from them? And in, fa and in fact, they exhort us to please learn from them. So let's see what they saw. All right, so here's slide number one. So we start out in 1 Nephi chapters 1 through 11. And in this portion of the Book of Mormon, we are introduced to the family of Lehi. His family is escaping death. They are leaving Jerusalem, which is their home. Um, and they left and went into the wilderness, living in tents with what they could carry. Um, and they brought their scriptures in addition to their provisions. Don't leave home without your scriptures. They traveled in wilderness situations. And their progress uh, in their travels was in equal proportion to their commandment keeping. So is there a foreshadowing to us in our day? Yes. The closer we adhere to the commandments of God the better off we're going to be. <clears throat> You'll see that these chapters also introduce a theme that you see throughout all of the Book of Mormon, and that is salvation for the obedient in Christ, not just in a future life, but in this life too. So Christ has the ability to save the obedient. It is our privilege and our choice um, to be obedient and to inherit all that the Father has to give us. In 1 Nephi 12, um, 
um, Lehi's son Nephi sees in vision the rise of his um, progenitors. He sees the rise of the Nephites in America and a crowning event, which is Christ's visit to them. He also sees their eventual decline and destruction. And why were they destroyed? It was due to temptations, vain imaginations, and pride. So what do we want to avoid as a people? If we want to avoid eventual destruction as well, what are the things we need to watch out for? Temptations. Don't succumb to them. Don't have vain imaginations and believe that you know everything. Um, have humility there and don't have pride. So there they're giving us a, a warning. Uh, Nephi also sees in vision in chapter 13, the modern day founding of America. So he sees Columbus. Um, he sees the church of Jesus Christ being restored on the earth again, the same as it was in Christ's day with a prophet and apostles, um, a hierarchy of the church, etc. He sees the coming forth of this, of this book, the book that he was helping to write, the Book of Mormon. In 1 Nephi 14 to 15, he sees more about the latter days, our time. He sees World War III, the great mother of abominations versus the Lamb of God. <clears throat> he sees the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of abominations. And he sees gospel teaching flipping from the Gentiles to the house of Israel. So we've had so many thousands of years to teach the Gentiles of the gospel of Christ. Now it's going to flip to the house of Israel where the Lamanites will be getting the gospel, the Jews, and the lost ten tribes. In chapters 16 to 19 of 1 Nephi, um, we see their lives, their refugee life in the wilderness, marriages, births, deaths, afflictions of hunger, thirst, fatigue, walking around with murmurers, shipbuilding, and ocean travels. And, you know, I think that they're sharing this refugee story with us because there's so many people in the world today who are refugees. I think there are about 82 million of them right now. Um, and I'm, I'm certain there are only going to be more because of just things that are happening in the world. Um, so we can relate to them. I also think it's foreshadowing. In 1 Nephi 20, Nephi quotes Isaiah. Um, Nephi did see our day, and he basically warns us, House of Israel, flee Bab Babylon. Don't follow the ways of the world. Cling to Christ. His way is the only way. It is the best way. In 1 Nephi 21, Again, he is looking forward to our day. He sees the lost ten tribes returning and saving the saints from the mother of abominations. Um, and these things have not happened yet, so he's letting us know <clears throat> that it, it is going to happen. He sees God's arm is bared, that all flesh will know that the saints were delivered by God. He sees the house of Israel, Jew and Gentiles, gathered to their lands of their inheritance. And he sees the mother of abominations and her minions war among themselves and destroy each other. In chapter 22 of 1 Nephi, again, Nephi sees the latter days. And you'll see at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, Nephi just stuffed that, stuffs these first several chapters with just so much information about our day. You know, he just did not want us to miss these very important things, which is so kind and good of him. So he interprets Isaiah, I, um, Israel will be scattered among all nations, he sees that, and they'll be confounded about Christ. Who is he? Um, is he the Savior or not? They'll be nursed by the Christians, by Christians, which I think are missionaries and other people, <clears throat> and the Lord, who will bring them out of captivity, obscurity, and darkness by um, informing them of, of Christ as the Savior and gathering them to the lands of their inheritance. They will know that Christ is the mighty one of Israel. Um, all the wicked churches, and yes, um, those two words go together. There are wicked churches out there. And all who fight against Zion shall be destroyed. He sees the end of the world, the millennium, Christ reigning, and he provides us with some instruction. Be safe in the end times. Repent, change, cling to the Savior. He is the source of salvation. In 2 Nephi chapter 1, we learn more about the latter days. Uh, remember what the Lord has done for you, bringing you out of your Jerusalem or whatever that land of death was for you, <clears throat> for them it was Jerusalem, to your land of promise. And for them, 
the Lord brought them from Jerusalem onto a ship over to the Americas. And that became their land of promise, their land of life. He, he's also shown that no one comes into America save they are brought by the hand of the Lord. So if you are in America, you were brought here by the hand of the Lord. If you serve him, it's your land of liberty. Otherwise, um, it's scattering, loss of possessions, smiting, and captivity. So this is a promised land. And if we are brought here, there is an expectation placed upon our heads that we will serve him. And if we serve him, it's going to be our land of liberty. liberty. Otherwise, we that's, our, that's going to be our future. So save yourselves with the armor of righteousness. <clears throat> in 2 Nephi 2-4, Lehi blesses his children and dies. And we see a prophecy about the coming forth of Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and the restoration of Israel. In 2 Nephi 5, we see um, a division within Lehi's family. So his oldest son, Laman, um, and Lemuel, which are kind of more of the wicked brothers. Um, and then, of course, there's Nephi, who is the righteous brother. <clears throat> right, um, Nephi and those who are like-minded with him, they flee from those wicked brothers, and they separate into two um, groups that... You know, back and forth in the Book of Mormon from this point forward, you see that the Nephites in general are the believers of Christ and Laman and Lemuel are the unbelievers. And you see that the believers flourish consistently and that the unbelievers are cursed consistently. And is that a foreshadowing for all of us in our time? Absolutely. There's a lesson to be learned there. And we'll see this over and over again in the Book of Mormon. In 2 Nephi 6, we see the latter days. Jacob sees our day. Now Jacob is Nephi's young brother. And Jacob quotes Isaiah. He sees the house of Israel is eventually restored. Um, he sees the righteous waiting for the coming of Christ. They are not destroyed. And they are not ashamed. The wicked, on the other hand, are destroyed by fire, tempest, earthquakes, bloodshed, pestilence, and famine. So as we in the last days move closer to the coming of Christ. You know, there are lots of things in the latter days that are prophesied about that don't look fun. Um, it looks like there's going to be a lot of things to wade through. Uh, but Jacob just wants us to know that if you wait for the coming of Christ, you will not be ashamed. The wicked are the ones who need to worry. So just don't be wicked. <clears throat> On this slide, you see latter days, latter days, latter days, all the way through. And again, they just want to teach us about our times. They want to sear these things into our brain. Um, um, for example, during the latter days, some righteous will experience temporary prey and captivity by their enemies. However, the righteous should set their places like flint, knowing that the adversity is temporary. Eventually, they will be saved by covenant with an everlasting salvation. And these chapters are gorgeous. You should read them. Um, learn and live the laws and commandments of Christ. He is strong. He will save you. You don't need to worry about it. The consequences of sin, however, are dire, and that's what you do need to worry about. In 2 Nephi 10 to 12, um, more about um, Isaiah. Jacob is rejoicing in what he learns about the latter days through Isaiah. Um, America, he sees, is, is a land of liberty where no king will rule. He sees temples all over the earth. And today I think we have about 170 working temples with about 250 total, both planned as well as in operation. And he sees these temples all over the globe. It must have been so exciting for him. Um, he sees the gathering of Israel in these scriptures. He learns about the second coming of Christ, <clears throat> the end of war, the millennium. And he just rejoiced in what he learned about this most exciting time in history or in the future, and for us, you know, it'll be the future for us too. Both Nephi and Jacob saw Christ. So these are very holy men who have authority and know what they're talking about. In 2 Nephi 13 to 14, more about the latter days, the abomination of desolations with protections withdrawn before the second coming of Christ, war, famine, captivity, death. These are all very ugly things that are going to be in the future. Uh, some people are experiencing them now. He sees a time where women will outnumber men seven to one. 
due to war deaths. I mean, that's just going to be such a difficult time. The obedient will escape the judgments in general that fall upon the wicked. So the Lord's, it, Lord's arm is mighty to save. We need to rely on him, his arm during this time. Um, Zion camps and people will be protected. In 2 Nephi 15 to 16, uh, there is history and foreshadowing of the abomination of desolation, the restoration of Christ's church as a gathering enzyme to the earth. This is the standard. The Lord has revealed his gospel in these days with the prophet, 12 apostles, um, etc. And that's the standard he wants the world to rise to. Um, there it also talks about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the gathering of Israel again. In 2 Nephi 17 to 24, um, Nephi sees the birth of Christ. We're told to fear God, not the world. The wicked will be destroyed and Babylon will fall at the second coming of Christ. Um, Christ will rule the world with justice, government, and peace and be praised in the millennium. So in this time, in, in the millennium, he won't be put up nailed upon a cross anymore. He will be praised um, and worshipped in the millennium. The fate of the wicked they will not rise, will not possess the land, or fill the world with cities anymore, but will be utterly swept off the earth. And we just are learn, we learn this lesson over and over. Satan has nothing good for you. The only person who has anything good for you is Christ. He is the one to whom you should come. Second Nephi 25, Nephi writes the things of Isaiah because he knows the judgments of God coming upon the Latter-day Gentiles and Jews. He writes for our benefit to convince us of the true Messiah. In addition to seeing the latter days, Nephi sees the entire history of his people from the rise and fall of the Nevites, including Christ's visit to them, which was a, a highlight, and it is a highlight of the Book of Mormon, to them receiving the Book, to them, um, receiving the Book of Mormon in the latter days. Nephi remarks on the evil churches of our day and contrasts them to Christ. In 2 Nephi 27, in the last days, the world will be drunk with evil and shall be visited with thunder, earthquake, a great noise, storm, tempest, and a flame of devouring fire. Nations that fight against Zion shall fail. So which party and camp should you be in? Zion camp. The Lord will give hit the saints the currently sealed portion of the Book of Mormon in his own due time. And there are also additional details of, of the millennium in chapter 27. And I can't wait for that currently sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. That's going to be awesome. In 2 Nephi 28, we see more details about the wickedness of today's corrupt and misleading churches. Those who preach false doctrines and pervert the right way of the Lord shall be thrust down to hell. So for those preachers who know that they're teaching false things or misleading things to their congregations, you're not going to escape the wrath of God. You know, he's coming for you. Well, I shouldn't say he's coming for you. That's not correct. But you'll be thrust down to hell for your actions. Um, and he also has a special warning to, the, to those people who outsource their religion. In other words, you just go and listen to the preacher. You don't study things for yourself. Those who trust these false teachers over the scriptures that God has provided to you um, are cursed. You will be led astray by them. <clears throat> and you'll be judged for those actions, judged according to your works, and damned at Judgment Day. So it's just a good warning for us all. In 2 Nephi 29, many Gentiles will reject the Book of Mormon. They will murmur and fight against it, saying, We have a Bible. We don't have we don't need any more Bible. God gave us what gave gave us one. Um and you know, you have to think about the logic of that. I mean, if, if Christ were to come and visit you in your home today, would you tell him, Oh, you know, thanks, but you know, I got this. You know, I, I don't need to learn anything from you. I, everything I ever needed to know is in the Bible. No, I bet you'd have some additional questions to ask him. And that's what the Lord does when he gives us additional scripture. He has things to teach us. And we just need to be humble enough to, to read them and pray about them. Eventually, we'll have the scriptures of the lost tribes of Israel, in addition to the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and the currently sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. In 2 Nephi 30, the gospel of Christ will be restored and brought to the world by the Gentiles. And Christ will destroy the wicked and reign in righteousness in the millennium. 
lots and lots of stuff about the last, the latter days. In 2 Nephi 31 to 33, in all things, Christ was obedient to the Father, including being baptized and enduring to the end. And we need to do the same. Obedience to Christ's laws is essential. We need to do the, th the things that Christ did and become like him. We need to feast on the words of Christ. They will tell us all things that we should do. And I like the word feasting there. Like We should be devouring these things and studying them and finding out how we can apply them in our lives. Um, we're exhorted to pray always and to reconcile our disobedient selves to Christ um, and choose to be saved. All right, in Jacob chapter 1, <clears throat> Jacob sets a good example. He labors diligently. He teaches the people. He attempts to persuade them to come into Christ so that their blood might not come upon his garments. Um, he talks about the need to serve others, to be spotless at the last day. In Jacob second, or in, in Jacob chapter two and three, he lectures at the temple and tells people some of the things they need to repent of. Repent of your lust for riches your pride and your arrogance thinking that you are better than others. So I live in America and I, I see this pride a lot among our people in terms of just pride and arrogance and, you know, thinking you're better than others. He said, no, that's not the way to be. The way to be is to be equal with all. Share your abundance. Prioritize the kingdom of God over riches. Apparently in their day, they had trouble taking one wife only uh, and not having and not design and they wanted to have concubines and basically he says no take one wife only don't have any concubines that is not good they needed to repent of that repent and save yourselves from the pains of hell the awful consequences that await the wicked and i think that's what's so loving about god is you know because he is a god and he knows all things he knows the paths to lead people in the most fertile valleys if you will of of life um, in this life and the next. And so he wants us to avoid those pains of hell and awful consequences. And all we need to do to, um, to walk in those fertile valleys is to obey his commandments. Jacob 4, seek not to counsel God, but to take counsel from his hand. The spirit speaks of things as they really are and as they really will be. In Jacob chapter 5, we see the history, scattering and gathering of the children of Israel in allegory form. Um, it's compared, uh, it, that's compared to uh, a vineyard. So Christ has done all, all for the world in trying to save his vineyard or these children of Israel. The gospel has been restored for the last time. We are among the last laborers in the vineyard to help save the world, the souls of men. Um, ultimately, the good fruit will be saved, the bad fruit will be cast out and burned. Choose to be the good fruit. Jacob 6, this is the last time that the servants of the Lord go forth to help save the world. The wicked will be cast out and burned. In Jacob 7, we are introduced to a false preacher named Sherem. So Sherem attempts to overthrow the doctrine of Christ in his day and lead the Nephites astray. He is asked for, he asks um, Jacob actually for a sign and Jacob said, well, you know, if the Lord decides to give you a, a sign and strike you dumb, then he will, he'll do it. And he did. So Jacob was, or excuse me, Sherem was struck down. Um, Jacob's faith is unshakable. He's had many revelations, seen and been ministered to by angels and has heard the voice of the Lord speaking to him. And it's a good chapter just to show the juxtaposition of somebody who attempts to be his own, you know, um, to laud himself up and to raise himself above other people, saying that he is the only way. And that that's not going to provide salvation. <clears throat> you contrast him to Jacob, who is humble and a servant and follows Christ and doesn't seek to become his own Christ, but but is obedient to Christ. And you see the end result of both people, right? One is struck down. The other is nurtured by angels and has had the, her, the voice of the Lord speaking to him. 
Um, we also learned some of the difficulties of refugee life in that chapter. In Enos chapter 1, we're introduced to a man named Enos. He prays mightily and gains a remission of his sins because of his faith in Christ. We learned that America is a holy land. The Lord promises salvation for the Lamanites in a future day. <clears throat> and um, the Book of Mormon is talked about coming forth. Enos shares his prophecies and testimony with his people and looks forward to his destiny in the eternities. That is what we should all be looking for. In the book of Jerem, the righteous Nephites win wars, and that's because they're righteous, and the bloodthirsty, murderous Lamanites lose wars because they're bloodthirsty and murderous. The word of the Lord is verified. Inasmuch or to the degree that you keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. So don't be surprised if the righteous, you know, um, receive, you know, win wars and have benefits and the wicked don't. Uh, so in Omni, the book of Omni, there's a warning. The wicked segment of the Nephites, a wicked segment of the Nephites are destroyed and swept off the land because they were wicked. Whereas righteous Nephites in that situation were spared because they were righteous. King Mosiah is warned in a dream to take his people and flee out of the land. Um, they are led by the power of God and find and join the people of Zarahemla. So even in difficult situations, the Lord blesses you. And in this case, Mosiah was warned in a dream that, that um, things are going to happen. You need to take your people and flee. And he was able to do that to escape the wrath of um, evil that was coming his way. At this point, um, Mormon. Now, Mormon, Mormon is among the, one of the last Nephites. Um, but he jumps in kind of off timeline because he's just read this book of Omni where he's seen a wet, wicked segment of the Nephites are destroyed. Well, he's at the very end of the Nephite civilization, and he has lived to see the destruction of his people. They were wicked, and they were swept off too. And I think he just jumps in here because the chapter that he just read just really hit his heart. He's lived to see the same thing. <clears throat> he basically jumps in and says, yep, the prophecies of the prophets, which we have been reading about thus far, have been fulfilled. Mormon prays that the records that he is helping to compile will be preserved, which has been fulfilled because we're reading them today. Um, then we jump back to, to um, King Mosiah and learn that false prophet False prophets, preachers, and teachers abounded in Mosiah's day, as did contentions and dissensions. Huh, that's exactly what's happening in our day. Tons of um, contentions and dissensions. And I think in America we have like something like 300, over 300 Christian denominations. Um, so there, there have got to be some people out there who just aren't telling the truth. Another thing. In regards to those contentions and dissensions, what established peace in the land during that time? Well, the preaching of the word of God established peace. That's how they dealt with their contentions and dissensions. The word of God helped heal that nation. And in our nation right now, we are extremely suffering from contentions and dissensions. And what can heal us too? The, the word of God it can help us establish peace. In Mosiah chapter 1, we learn the importance of scriptures on education to know the mysteries of God and to keep the commandments always in front of our eyes. Don't rely on the traditions of men for the right way. Search the scriptures diligently and directly to profit thereby. And I might add to make sure that you're not listening to preachers who will lead you astray. And if you follow them, you'll be damned. So read the words of God directly and profit thereby, keep the commandments, choose to prosper in the land. It's a choice. In Mosiah 2, we're introduced to a new king, King Benjamin. He speaks. He's been a righteous lawgiver and ruler, spending time in the service of his people without requiring taxes of the people. He remarks that serving others is serving God. God serves us, and all that he requires is that we keep his commandments, which, if we do, he blesses and prospers us in all things. We are warned of um, wickedness, contention, and obeying evil spirits because they lead to unquenchable hellfire. Hell fire. So 
you know, don't be contentious, um, don't be evil, don't dwell in wickedness. They, there's nothing good for you. Satan has nothing good for you. In Mosiah chapter 3, an angel appears to King Benjamin and teaches him about Christ, the Savior, and righteous judge of mankind. We learn that God, God uses prophets to share his mind and will on earth, and that men damn themselves by their own actions. Um, and hence we see the importance of denying sin and becoming holy. We are in charge of ourselves. <clears throat> um, here's a, a, one of those um, gospel tidbits that I think was lost in the Bible, that infants and little children can't sin. They are saved in Christ. So if you had an infant that wasn't baptized, for example, uh, before he or she passed out of this world, you don't need to worry about them. They're not going to be damned. Um, they are innocent and they can't sin and they are saved in Christ. At the judgment bar, all are judged by their works, whether they are good or whether they're evil. In Mosiah chapter 4, salvation comes to those who trust in the Lord, keep his commandments, and endure to the end in faith. Repent of your sins and forsake them. Remember always the goodness, long-suffering, love of God, and rejoice. Teach your children, serve the poor and needy, watch your thoughts, words, and deeds. Those are other things that are going to judge us in the last day, not just our, our works, but also our thoughts, words, and deeds. Basically, who are you and who have you become on earth? Have you come closer to being like Christ or have you become closer to being like Satan? Who, who, who is your God? In Mosiah 5 to 6, King Benjamin's people covenant to do God's will and be obedient to his, command, to his commandments for the rest of their lives to avoid the remorse of hell. Now they are providing a good example to us. They are counseled to abound in good works that Christ may forever seal them his. And isn't that what, what we want? We want Christ to seal us his. In Mosiah 7, we also get another warning. Um, the Nephites in the city of Lehi-Nephi are in bondage to the Lamanites because of their iniquity. So sin and affliction go hand in hand because sin has awful consequences. And those consequences eventually kept, catch up to you. In Mosiah 8, we um, are instructed that prophet seers can know all things, past, current, and future, through faith, they work miracles and greatly benefit humankind. In Mosiah chapters 9 to 10, the Nephite descendants move from Zarahemla um, and they settle in the land of their fathers. They're attacked. They pray mightily to the Lord for protection from those seeking to murder and enslave them. And they were righteous enough to be delivered. For every one Nephite killed, 11 Lamanites are slain. So if you're a Lamanite, you're thinking to yourself, what just happened? You know, for every one of them, 11 of us were killed. And it's just another reminder that, you know, wickedness does not pay. The Lord will bless the righteous and protect them from you if you're being wicked. <clears throat> king Zenith, who was the king at the time who moved these descendants from Zarahemla, he prepares his people against further attacks and the people prosper. Years later, they are attacked again by the Lamanites who are a fierce and angry people, and what do you know, they win the war again. And I think that, that we get these things over and over again, just so that they really sink in, that when it's our turn where we're persecuted or when we have things where the, ads are, where the odds are stacked against us, not to worry. If, if we are obedient to the Lord, he is going to save us. He is mighty to save. Mosiah 11 to 16 Zenith confers the kingdom to his son, Noah, which turns out to be a really bad thing because Noah it becomes extremely wicked. He changes the government. He installs taxes of the people at 20% to support himself, the lazy priests that he appoints, and collectively all of their wicked lifestyles. So the people labor exceedingly to support iniquity. Not only that, they don't boot him out. Um, they believe his lies, they follow his bad example, and turn from righteousness to sin. And whenever that happens, I'm sure the heavens weep because you're going to be losing protections and there are going to be some consequences that are going to come your way. 
The Lord tells a prophet named Abinadi to command them to repent and keep the commandments. So Abinadi does, with beautiful sermons about Christ and the requirements of salvation. So worth reading. In Mosiah chapter 17, one of Noah's priests, and he was wicked. Alma used to be wicked, but he believes and he writes the words of Abinadi. Um, so he repents of, I guess, whatever he had been doing up to that point. Um, and he sees Abinadi, or at least finds out that Abinadi suffers death by fire for his testimony. Abinadi prophesies war, disease, and death upon his murderers and the unrepentant people of the land. So he issues them a warning. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, Alma um, secretly goes among the people and, and starts teaching the words of Abinadi. Um, he is successful in his missionary efforts. He baptizes about 400 or so uh, people, and all of them together covenant to serve one another and to keep God's commandments. So even though Alma only has like this 400 plus group of people, he, among those 400 plus people, he serves as a leader to them and undoes the tax um, increases among his 400, you know, person flock. His people faithfully support each other spiritually and temporally, which is interesting. Alma is warned by the Lord to flee with his people. Again, if you choose righteousness, the Lord helps to protect you. <clears throat> in Mosiah chapter 19, the Lamanites invade. And guess what? They enslave Noah's people and they demand a 50% tribute. And you know what? All of that could have been avoided if the people would have just repented, but they didn't. Um, so now they're enslaved and 50% of everything they make goes to their enemies. Um, King Noah is killed by fire and Abinadi prophesied that whatever you do to me is going to happen to you. And that's exactly what happened. They killed him by fire. And then King Noah was also killed by fire. All right. In Mosiah 20, Limhi is the new king who replaces Noah. After two years, the Lamanites accuse Limhi's people of stealing some of their daughters, and they attack them in war. <clears throat> um, Limhi's people defeat the Lamanites, even though they were only half the size of the Lamanites. Now, why did they defeat the Lamanites? Maybe it wasn't because they were super, super righteous, but they were at least a little more righteous than the Lamanites were. Um, so they were, um, they were at least able to win the war. The words of Abinadi continue to be fulfilled. The people are smitten on every hand economically and hunted and killed in war. It's a horrible time. In chapter 21, slavery gets even worse. The Lamanites smite them, exercise authority over them, put heavy burdens on their backs and drive them as cattle. The people of Limhi proactively go to war against the Lamanites three times, but they are defeated and slain. Many widows in the land mourn. The people are humbled. They submit to their enemies. There's no other choice. And they just pray mightily to God to help them. Things get slightly better until one day, Ammon, who's from the land of Zarahemla, um, he had been sent by his people to go find these people <clears throat> who had gone north and nobody had heard from them ever since. So when Ammon arrives, people are so happy to see him because he knows the way back to Zarahemla. So the people, uh, repentant people, covenant to serve God and keep his commandments, and they all study how to escape. Now you can just get a sense of the excitement and the good things that are coming their way, right? Because they covenanted to serve God and keep his commandments. In Mosiah chapter 22, Limhi's people exploit the Lamanites' wine-bibbing by providing extra wine in their tribute packages, and they sneak out of the city after the Lamanites' soldiers are drunk and asleep. They arrive in Zarahemla, a free people. All right, but if you think about it, think about Alma's people. Alma's people, um, they were also from, the, from um, Noah's time, but they had repented. And so the Lord helped to save them. You compare that with Limhi's people, or, or, you know, yeah, I guess I could say that, Limhi's people. And, you know, the, the, now we have a whole generation of 
women who don't have their husbands anymore, they're killed in war, and their children don't have fathers anymore, and they're not going to get those fathers back. And so they're just consequences to being sin that are just dire. And we should, as good as it is to repent, it's even better to not sin in the first place. Sin has a heavy cost. Stay sin free. All right, back to Alma's people in Mosiah chapter 23. So yes, Alma's people were warned um, by God to flee. So they find a place to live and they start building a city called Elam. Alma refuses to be king among them. He exhorts the people not to trust their government to kings or their lives to false preachers, which is, you know, two times good advice. But we also learn here that we can't just look at a person and say, oh, you're having bad things happen in your life. That, may, that means you must have a ton of sin because that's not how life works. And the Lord shows us that in Mosiah chapter 23. He says here that the Lord will try the, faci- the patience, faith, and trust of his people. So he lets them have difficulties in life too. They're not completely immune from difficulty. Righteous people will have challenges. Um, so while the Lamanites, remember they had just had tons of wine, they were asleep, they wake up, and Lamanites people are gone. So naturally they go out to search for them. And they get lost in the wilderness, naturally. <laughs> um, instead, they find the wicked priests of King Noah. So when um, the Lamanites first arrived in the city um, uh, during uh, King Noah's reign, um, some of the wicked leaders decide to leave their families. And so they escape into the wilderness. And Amulon is one of those wicked priests. And Amulon and his bunch of wicked leaders had captured uh, some Lamanite daughters and had basically, I don't know, I guess married them in the wilderness or just took them as their wives in the wilderness. And so the <clears throat> Lamanite army finds them and Amulon with his slick tongue is able to convince the Lamanites to not you know, kill them for what they did, but they're able to join the Lamanite army and together Amulon's people and this army, they find the city of Helam. Now Helam, you know, it's a city of like 400-ish people. So they don't have a choice other than just to surrender. So they surrender and wicked Amulon, who knows Alma because they both were priests under King Noah, wicked Amulon is set as a leader over them. So Amulon's people persecute and to some degree enslave Alma's people. Alma's people who are righteous, they pray and they are comforted by the Lord who remembers their covenants. He strengthens them so that they can bear their burdens with ease. They pass the test of trust, patience, and faith, and they are delivered out of bondage. So yes, temporarily we might be subject to pray, by our enemies, um, but it's temporary and the Lord will always find a way for us out of bondage. So Alma's people are delivered out of bondage and they flee to Zarahemla. So if you contrast that with Limhi's people, they both were captured by the same army, right? The same Lamanites. Um, But Limhi's people suffered much, much more than Alma's people. Um, And you can attribute that to their righteousness, Alma's people's righteousness. Okay, um, just the last couple of bits here. Um, on Mosiah chapter 25, the people of Zarahemla assemble and learn what happened to the history of Zenith's people. Alma teaches and baptizes in Zarahemla. They are all of one faith, which would be great for us in America, you know, given our 300 plus Christian denominations. In Mosiah chapter 26, There's a warning. The rising generation refuses to believe um, in the gospel of Christ. They live carminally and persecute believers. Alma prays about them and is told, when Christ comes again, they will regret their choice to condemn themselves to hell with the devil and his angels. Those who don't repent are not numbered among God's people in life or death. And this really brings to mind the importance of this life's decisions. There are high stakes associated with with this life. 
make good decisions and choose Christ. And then in Rosiah chapter 27, King Rosiah puts an end to the religious persecution with new legislation. So I only went through these first 200 pages because obviously this takes a lot of work and a lot of time. So I'm just going to see if there is a lot of interest um, in this. And um, if people like it, I'll, I'll, you know, keep going and possibly put together more of these. But here's the first 200 pages and I hope you enjoy them. Thank you.